Hello all, and welcome to the ECHO 2020 Summit Leadership Series we're hosting throughout this month, reflecting the importance of leadership, reputation, and trust at a time of great change and challenge. For those of you who haven't been with us before, um, please do use the chat function uh, on your Zoom bottom, bottom, bottom line um, throughout the discussion to raise any comments or questions uh, you might like to ask at the end. Uh, during our 10 minute uh, question and answer session. So we make sure that we end up uh, before the end of the hour and I hopefully can call on you as well. Um, as with our previous sessions, I would just like to briefly set the scene of today's topic on crises. And rather than look at the cause of crises, which I know we'll get into in, in, in a brief moment, I'd just like to highlight the impact on the financial value alone um, of a reputational crisis that should make most boards sit up and take notice. Um, and my very first chart here just literally touches on um, some crises many of you may be aware of um, from Exxon to J&J &J and Texaco and so on. And then more recently, um, some ones that have been uh, perhaps more prominently in the news of late, uh, Deepwater Horizon, um, VW, Dieselgate, uh, even TalkTalk, Talk, um, and obviously Boeing, uh, just looking at the impact in terms of the cost of uh, the market capitalization loss and the percentage overall. These are significant numbers. This is a significant asset to consider. Um, and my final chart before I get into our session, just again to highlight it, is to understand when uh, reputations are affected um, which bit gets touched uh, and hit the, 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 the most? So which drivers of reputation are actually pulling the value down? And in this instance, it was, a, it was a case for a pharmaceutical company that had a lot of product recalls. In some of the more in, uh, recent instances we've been looking at, um, things like uh, social responsibility, corporate governance, and quality of management have all been called into questions, perhaps in some of the more recent, uh, more recent crises that we can remember. So with that, um, if you, for those of us who were with us yesterday, uh, you may remember we heard from Andy Farrow um, at Mars about purpose and the sustainability imperative. And as Susan Hooper said, he could and should write the book for all board directors who want to be um, climate competent. Um, so today we're going to hear from someone who actually did write the book from deep personal experience observation and assessment, and now coaches and advises leaders um, about how organizations fall into and come out of corporate crises with lessons for us all. And this is from Matt Nixon, uh, author of this great book. You may be seeing it backwards, um, but it's Pariah's Hubris and Corporate Reputation. Um, and it's a, it's a tremendous book. And helping, helping the conversation along, uh, we have um, uh, Matt's uh, friend and former senior colleague at uh, Shell, Bjorn Edlund, who's also on ECHO's advisory board. Um, we're in for a great session ahead. Um, Bjorn, over to you, and Matt Nixon, thank you so much for joining us today. Bjorn. Thank you, Sandra. Hi, Matt. Good to see you again. 
It's to you. So, um, as Sandra said, you 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 work and you have worked as a counselor for top management in in large organisations. Now you do it, you know, in an advisory capacity. But you've seen crises develop up close and, and, and in real time. So, so what did you learn from that, and why why did you sit down and write a book about it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I sometimes wonder whether I should have done, but it, it's it's uh, it was a great fun to do actually, and a good way of. So one answer is simply it was a way of processing all these experiences I'd had. First off, at Shell, I joined Shell just after the reserves crisis, and and shortly before you did actually, I think if it's right, if yeah. my memory is right, and we were in the process of trying to rescue this company from this sort of mammoth mega crisis really that was very existential and a lot of people don't realize that BP very nearly took Shell over um, and there was a very serious crisis that could have cost the organization its existence and did cause a huge amount of organizational change so I was very involved in in trying to lead that change at, at Shell uh, as you were um, so that was a one-off and I'd had those experiences and I'd lived in Shell realizing that we were always going through crises and always in the press for a lot of difficult reasons as well as the good ones we felt we deserved to be there for and then I went to uh, sort of out of the frying pan into the fire really because I went to Barclays in London and I arrived just in time for the LIBOR crisis and I was quite uh, in a good position to kind of observe that and be involved with that and some of the attempts to fix things afterwards and having had those experiences I was aware that um, employees don't get a lot of a voice in this so the press comment and politicians comment and some of the senior leaders of the business go on record and say things but a lot of the things that we know to be true or that we felt about the businesses we lev lived in weren't being voiced and I became kind of interested as were we all um, kind of colluding I suppose in, 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 a, in a world where we accepted that these businesses were becoming very difficult, very reputationally challenged, or rather permanently reputationally challenged, uh, and accepting that and they were becoming weaker and weaker and trust and societal trust was damaging and was there anything that could be done about it. So I sat down and sort of thought about these things a bit and tried to write a book that examined both the causal side of that and the leadership side, which we're not going to talk about as much today, I guess, as perhaps mm. the outside, which is what is the impact and what do you do if you've uh, been in a major crisis? So the book is called Pariah, and obviously we know what pariahs are in, in general terms, but what is a pariah organization and how do companies stumble and fall to become pariahs? Yeah, this was an idea of trying to put a label on something that didn't quite have a name. Uh, I, I mean, the concept of pariahs comes from um, India and uh, this idea of there uh, being people who are perhaps um, outside of society, but somehow inside it as well. So they're quite a useful um, purpose but but are but are not but are not well regarded um the theory i have is that pariah organizations are well known they have a, a prominent brand they are more infamous than famous at least with some stakeholder groups and for some stakeholder groups they're really heavily stigmatized so they're finding themselves permanently under attack they may have um, well organized opposition to them um websites that uh, are sort of <laughs> dedicated to their uh, eradication and so on mm. and 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 you know you might not be one yet but, but but those are the sort of that's the established pariah world and we all know that if we've been in big oil or big tobacco or big pharma or any of these sort of well-established pariah industries but the theory was that this could be something that would spread and would rapidly be an opportunity for almost anybody public sector private sector people who thought they were doing enormous good in the world, you know, you might suddenly find yourself surprised and become a pariah. Uh, and, and, and that this was more likely because of the rise of um, uh, social media and so on. So, uh, but I, it seems to, I mean, okay, so I'm so sure social media is accelerating and, and, and sort of amplifying this, but it seems to me that you're, the way that you've organized your thoughts around the different stages in, in how, to be, how you get to be a pariah. And also your thoughts about how to redeem yourself once you've sort of hit bottom, um, uh, have a, a kind of a longer perspective in them. I mean, there is almost sort of a historical way of looking at, at it, almost as if companies are organisms or you know part of yeah, an ecosystem. Yeah. Right? yeah so tell me a little bit about your taxonomy. Tell me a little about it's the stages. And, and yeah, should we should we put the slide up uh, and see if that uh, is useful? So this is the. The life cycle is the idea. So there's a bit of a life cycle model idea here of um, 
this sort of stuff that goes on. Um, so if you start on the top with the, this just Genesis idea, you know, forgive me that all these things rhyme. It was a, uh, it seemed fun at the time. Um, the Genesis idea is that you start out with uh, certain characteristics, which we can talk about more if people are interested. That then creates a an organization of considerable success, probably, and people start to tell you, at least in some ways, you're doing very well. Uh, but there may be flaws in the governance. My feeling was that there was hubris in leadership, often in the entire culture of these companies, uh, and perhaps in their entire industries. There was a gap between what senior people knew and should know. There was a a growing blocking of the negative noises or negative data uh, and people just stop paying attention to the warning signs. Then a crisis occurs. It could be externally generated as with COVID, which is, I think, revealed in Warren Buffett's world, words that a lot of people are swimming naked uh, in terms of business model or, or brand, but um, various kinds of crises. And I looked at a lot of them. So I, I did a study of all the, having been through and run some crisis uh, um, investigations myself in the companies I've worked in and as a consultant, I then started looking at all the data and all the information and waded through all these long reports. And what you see is there's certain common features to it. And this hubris idea is, is, is actually there, whether it's named as, not, as such in almost all the background. And then you get into what actually happens in a crisis uh, and this stage of nemesis. When a nemesis is this stage which we don't talk about, but there is this sort of public shaming betrayal, reputational failure, perhaps even a point of organizational failure. So if you're really- is this, where, is this where the big headlines come? I yeah, mean. and this is game over for some people. So if okay. you're, if you're a Carillion, it's, 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 it's game over at this point. Hmm. Um, uh, especially if you run out of money or you run out, or if you're Anderson, you run out of trust in, in that, then you just become unemployable. And then, then there's this urgent desire, and I think this will probably affect a lot of the people on this call to get involved in, get us out of this, you know, <laughs> make this go away, make the press stop being nasty to us, get the share price up. So uh, my theory is that the metamorphosis is often um, not good enough. A good metamorphosis will lead to catharsis, which is forgiveness, so societal forgiveness, the forgiveness of your customers, your governments, your stakeholders. A bad metamorphosis, which is often what people do, is just a whitewashing exercise or a cover-up or a, uh, you know, here's some new leaders. Then the, the old leaders were the bad leaders and here are the new good leaders and they'll be fine. Uh, and you tell the press a nice story about what you're going to do and the transformation of the company and, and off you go. But all too often, uh, the whole thing rolls around again because the culture hasn't changed enough. Mm. So, so this idea was that metamorphosis is a really difficult thing to do because it involves taking some risks. Um, um, and I talk in the book about uh, real metamorphosis in the animal kingdom, don't forget, the real metamorphosis, you actually liquidize your whole body <laughs> using, you know, caterpillar turns into a butterfly, but it's a very dangerous state to be in that people state because you're, a, you know, you're at great risk there. So you, 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 it's a very big bet and it's not surprising therefore that people find it very difficult to do. And um, so the, the temptation to whitewash or the temptation to try to move on and just declare, you know, let's turn the page. And, and, and as you say, here were the bad leaders. Now we've changed these two things. And here's a, a rebranding and a new logo and perhaps even a new name for some stuff that we've been doing before and so on. Um, how, how can communicators intervene um, in you know, first of all, I mean, the, the various ways of I, I think we should leave this chart up because it's it's really good to talk through it. So, in the stage pre hubris, how I mean, who should the head of communications talk to to find allies within the company to try and intervene with senior management and perhaps even intervene in the culture? Yeah, it's a good question. I I, I think that that you have to um, you, your point about finding allies is very important. First and foremost, I guess the question is all the senior leaders and what is the culture of senior leadership? If you find yourself as a senior communicator in an organization where the senior leadership are enjoying uh, being out of touch and don't want to hear employees aren't interested in what the outside world thinks, it's very difficult. Um, yeah. You may need to you may to go um, sort of cultivate uh, friends at the board. 
but I think one looks, this is one of the areas where functional people can really make a difference as well as business leaders who have vertical responsibilities. If you've got a horizontal responsibility for something like HR um, or finance, you, you, you often are aware of stuff that's going on. Um, I used to talk, you know, you and I used to talk at, at Shell, if you recall, uh, yes. quite a bit. Uh, because we had sort of interesting and parallel jobs. We also used to talk to the head of internal audit, who yeah. was another person who saw a lot of stuff going on, and we compared notes, and then we could say, well, there's stuff going on in this culture, isn't there? Hmm. Uh, uh, this keeps happening. This is a pattern. So I think looking for patterns, l listening for data, um, and forming your own uh, view about what's going on is very important having your own data as well so you can then go and challenge leadership with it if you need to so mm. say like employee surveys and stuff like that are much maligned but actually they have their they have their uses i mean if i've taken an example from what we worked on together was you know try to intervene early on in a project phase so that you i mean especially now with external pressures to make sure that you took non-technical risk into consideration and, and, and that you sort of did almost like an um, anthropo anthropological study of situations on, on the ground. This is something that where, where I found it, it was absolutely invaluable to have an ally like you to, to, to say, so what are the keywords I should use to, when I talk to engineers about this to make them listen to this? Because it sounds all very fluffy and irrational, but it could be the difference between, you know, intervening early enough after the genesis so you don't get to the hubris stage but back into you know good sort of behavior again yeah we we were operating some very difficult parts of the world doing some very difficult things that were very expensive uh often with huge and um, not always very friendly governmental pressures uh so it's very tempting to just build the kit get the license to operate pay the taxes and and and, and move on um, but as we discovered in places like Corrib in Ireland, uh, a very small number of angry farmers who'd been you know, not very well dealt with held the whole thing up and cost us, I don't know the number, you may remember the numbers, but it was very large numbers of, of you know, not being able to get a gas plant built in a relatively developed country. Was, was, and this was not the first time we'd made those sort of errors. And we, no. we tended to keep on making the same mistakes. That's partly why I formulated the theory was... You know, proves very difficult, but we tried to get that then built in to the way we uh, taught people how to manage projects. So the mm -hmm. Project Academy, uh, which I was involved with a little bit at, at Shell, was about how do you teach people from the off that your main job, if you're leading one of these big things, is not building the kit because that's difficult, but this is harder and you need to get this license to operate and you need to think about a lot of different stakeholders if you're going to be able to do this stuff. Yeah, and it was also... Um... I mean, the, the, a conflict of uh, sort of, of conflicting goals were built into the job description of the ticket, of, of the project director as well, because they, they both had stakeholder responsibility and the technical financial responsibility. It was interesting to see, to see that someone who came out of finance, Peter Voser, when he became CEO, changed the organizational structure to take take this conflict uh, out of, of, of the system. And you had one territorial manager who was a stakeholder um who stakeholder responsible and then you had a technical financial chief who, who looked after the kit as you call it but, uh, um how could, so so you hit rock bottom you, you're 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 in the metamorphosis phase you have recognized that you have problems uh and and so what people what do people like you and i then do within the organization to make sure that we we get on the right path uh in the metamorphosis i think the hardest thing is taking enough time uh, over the diagnostics to actually know what went wrong because there's a tendency to dive on it and say we know what will happen um, and if we do this it'll it'll be all right again um, just taking a little longer to really think through what was the root cause of the problem can often be really important for the long-term health of the business and that's the tension for sure between I any mean, there's things you do have to do you do have to often change leadership out, for example. But you also have to think through, you know, is this particular one recoverable? Sometimes you realize that this particular setup is a mess and it's going to remain a mess and you might want to cut bait, actually. Um, Alaska comes to mind mm. uh, for some reason. And uh, whereas 
in another situation, you, you, you know, you, you, what you're really doing there is saying for the good of the long term of the company, we need to get the organizational learning out of this. So one of the things I think good companies do is they do look, spend a bit of time on really figuring out what happened, not just doing a whitewash exercise that they can you know, blast through and move on. Um, the, the other thing is they need to communicate that to the outside world. I remember when I was at, Shell, uh, at Barclays, sorry, um, we were bounced into what became the SALTS review because the outgoing chairman who had resigned to try and save Bob Diamond's job um, said, we'll do a root and branch review of our business practices. Boom, just wrote that in his resignation statement. Nobody asked us what that was like. And, and, and I was one of the people who kind of was left standing the reasonably senior level I had to figure out what we were going to do with that and, and, and turn that into a sort of terms of reference for this big external review. So you've then done a kind of thick of it kind of problem, you know, created a review that could kill you all because mm -hmm. if the American tort lawyers get hold of everything, you're, you're sunk. And yet if you don't do a decent job of a clear review of what's happened, you're equally sunk. So that, that's very challenging. Doing a really good external review, whilst healthy in some ways, is very difficult to run. How much of this comes back to the ability to be able to coach and mentor up from the functional position, like the ones we had, and talk to the senior leaders? I think as I've become older and, and, and uh, you know, gnarly, I've become braver. And I think one of the things that it's really good not just to have um, functional people, but it's one of the reasons why not all the people in an organization probably ought to be insiders who've had their entire career there because you do need that external perspective mm. and some of the weight and, and hopefully um, respect that can bring. But also, I remember you and I, I mean, there's a sort of certain amount of indifference to, I mean, if, 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 if at the end Shell had rejected us and said, we can't stand these guys, uh, get rid of them, but we'd have lived and we knew we would live. We didn't have to please that's these true. people all the that's time. True. And that's, that takes courage, but it's also uh, quite important. So, but, but it is, um... So the sense of independence and a real independence in terms of you know the counselor, the coaching, the the um, feedback you, you could give us as a functional leader. That's what you're saying. Yeah, well, I think functional leaders need to be given that power in an organisation, and that again is a function of how the CEO runs it and, and and what they're prepared to tolerate. So you could you can have better or worse environments for that. How, how have things changed since? I mean, not just COVID, but how you think the climate has gotten better or worse in terms of slipping into pariahdom? Yeah, I mean, there's this danger that if, if in a world where everyone's a pariah, no one's a pariah. Mm. What, what I was worried about has got worse. What I was worried about and remain worried about as a sort of citizen, I suppose, is, is a world in which we don't, we're losing our trust of each other and our ability yeah. to work together to make society operate well. Uh, it's becoming very balkanized and politics is incredibly mm. balkanized and um, Neil, Neil Sherlock I see is on the call, he and I are on the board at Demos uh, in a think tank that's sort of devoted to trying to hold that, that debate together. So that matters to me personally. I think corporately it's become a, a, an even more difficult environment because these things just get quicker. And the other thing that really, when I was doing the research, I realized how the pace at which crises evolve and therefore the pace at which you're gonna to have to react to them is just increasing and that's very difficult. So it's almost like a centrifugal force where, where, and where the stabilizing factors are, are being whittled away rather than you know, the shared context, the sort of the belief in certain <laughs> unalienable truths like uh, you know you should listen to the science or you should try and work for the common good and and, and, and these sort of things is that what you mean yeah well i'm sure shared truth is the base of this i i think it's very hard to have shared truth i've become i've realized it's harder than i thought it was i mean mm. things what were bloody obvious turn out not to be so bloody obvious and uh within an organizational culture and context shared truth may not be the truth of the outside. So at Shell, we could be very oblivious, for example, to the shared truth of the outside world that fossil fuels were going to become irrelevant. Mm. If you think about today's announcement in the UK, uh, I'm not sure even 10 years ago, we'd have, we'd have predicted it would be quite that, um, you know, quick. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, 
if how does COVID change? Well, let's go back to COVID. How has COVID changed the picture? Has it changed the picture? What does COVID do with I, I think, I, to I, trust? I, I think COVID I reflected on it. I haven't thought really super deeply about it, I'm afraid, but but I think COVID has changed the picture in as much as it's revealed weaknesses. I, all the clients I've talked to and all the work I've done over the last six months, you've realized that it, it exacerbated what was already there. So if you had a weak financial model, uh, you, were, you were more easily broken. If you had a strong culture, if you had a culture that cared about people, if you were real, you know, look at a place like Timpson's uh, in the UK, the shoe, the shoe repair place, uh, the, you know, look how they responded. That was because they are who they are. And mm. they didn't manufacture that after the crisis. It was so that you, 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 you're definitely picking up on your reality there. I think the, the other thing it's done is it's, it's put employees back in the picture, not just leaders. So the hero leader, which we've gone probably too far on, whose apotheosis is, is Trump, I suppose. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got the hero employee and cheating entry-level employees as, as heroes too is a very interesting um, mm. change and I think a welcome one. But it, it hasn't, it's then got to go back into, okay, that's great. But if in fact we're treating them as very low price mercenaries and we mm. don't really want to uh, commit to them and yet we expect their loyalty to their organization. We've got a, we've got a crisis brewing uh, ahead. So, so what, what organizational steps can people take in terms of cultural organizational steps to, to reinforce at least the resilience of, of, of the company within in this sort of volatile environment? I think you've got to have a conversation that involves your employees and your stakeholders that hopefully you've got going anyway, but you need to make these you of know, double down on that. Um, the, the leaders I've seen who've been really successful in the last six months, despite being sort of limited to maybe interacting more through a screen than in person, mm. are, are really very diverse in their communication and their conversation. And they're good at listening as well as talking. So they're actually, they actually are hearing what people are thinking and, and what their fears are and are you know, moving in real time to react to that, not necessarily in terms of changing the strategy of the company, if that's not appropriate, but they're, they're quite adept at uh, understanding a lot of different points of view. So are we going more towards a stakeholder model, a stakeholder run economic system rather than a shareholder focused one? I mean, it's... Yeah, I, that's a political question, I suppose, as much as an, uh, an, yeah. um, the observation is that the, the political environment is moving um, that way. But it, it would be, in, I, I would have thought it would be a way for companies to insulate themselves against, against some of the turbulence as well. Because, I mean, you know, you can't behave, you, don't, you can't communicate your way out of a situation you behave your way into. You have to behave your way out of a crisis as well, yeah. right? Well, I think that could be quite situational. I mean, I imagine if you're in a company where the problem is they're running a cash, your your CFO is going to be your best friend and in, in, in their ability to to sort that out in, in, in the city. And that's not going to have a great deal to do with what the NGOs think. No, I wasn't thinking of NGOs as stakeholders. I was thinking of the people who actually use your products. And right, the yeah. You, the communities that you live in and so on. But I mean, it's... Anyway, so... <laughs> But the parietum is not going to go away. Final question is not going to go away from me. I mean, it'll be other questions. I, I can't see it. I, I think um, maybe this multiple world in which one person's pariah is somebody else's hero is an interesting one to look at. I wrote the book today. I'd have to deal with Trump and the legacy of the politics of the last five years. And, and, and that would be a different view, I suppose. I'd sure. have to think a bit hard about that. But um, I worry, and if that does worry me, I, I do think we need some shared reference points about what's actually going on. If we can't mm. agree on reality, uh, it's very hard to agree on how to manage it. 20,000 lives in four years. One man. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, I think it's back to you now. Wonderful, wonderful. Matt, we could go on and on. I know we could, Bjorn, great questions, great input. I know the two of you work closely together and you've been each other's best friends and supporters throughout many, many issues. Um, 
Yesterday we were talking about Mars. Today we're talking about multiple universes. So um, heaven knows what tomorrow is going to bring, but uh, really fascinating. And we've had some fantastic questions. I was going to start with a question from uh, Jan uh, Dalman, who's with us, but actually you answered it in your, in your last answer. So I'd like to start uh, probably in order with uh, Flick Howard Allen. Flick, would you like to raise your first question? And then I'll go on to Nick Archer. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. Uh, fa fascinating talk. Thank you so much, Matt. Really, really interesting. And I love that diagram. Always really helpful to see something really clearly laid out. So my question is, what in your view are the key reasons why metamorphoses fail? Thanks, Flick. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, I, I think the main reason they fail is they don't start in the sense they're not metamorphoses. I think they're mislabeled. I think what most people do is try and go back to normal. And we've had a lot of interesting discussion about that, haven't we, with, with, with COVID? Because people have said, well, what about going back to normal? And then people have reluctantly admitted maybe there's a new normal. What people haven't generally been able to do is say, actually, what really has happened, because we're not out the, you can't really do this until you've finished the crisis bit, uh, or possibly even the nemesis bit of your cycle. But how do you figure out what's really changed? Um, how do you figure? And you have to, you, you're going to have to probably parallel track some things that are undoubtedly good for, 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 for change and some other things which, you know, you need to dig a bit deeper on if you're really going to get the most out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Flick. Um, Nick Archer, if, if you're with us, would you like to join us and unmute yourself? May have lost. Oh, no, there you are. Oh, hey, um, uh, Bjorn, Matt, thanks so much. Thanks, Sandra. Um, Matt, obviously speaking hypothetically here, but uh, sometimes um, big organizations, as they emerge from a crisis, senior management actually um, either sort of deny the reasons for the crisis in the first place um, and or, or become super defensive. Yes. In order to, to move people on to that even buying the concept of the metamorphosis phase, how do you break through that clay? Any, any tips that you can share? Yeah, I mean, I think for anyone to, I mean, sort of simple simplicity, it's very attractive to say, it's very hard to do. It's about how do you make it safe enough to admit that you were wrong or might've been wrong. Mm. Um, and and you know, don't consult lawyers, by the way. Uh, but but, but it's, it's got something to do with this notion of apology. And I write in the book a bit about apologies and corporate apologies and, and, and uh, people have written much better things than this. There's some good, there's some good articles and uh, there's an HBR article that's very good on this. But I do think people could, you need to start with, do you actually recognize that something is going wrong? Uh, so this is the counseling bit inside the, inside the organization. Do you, boss, do you see that there is a problem? Yes, no, because there is a problem, and I'm telling you there's a problem, <laughs> and data helps with that. So that, that trying to get that to be not a, an emotional, it's your fault problem, but a kind of, you know, there is a problem which we need to solve. And then convincing that they actually need to be part of the solution, that they're, it's theirs. If they're a heroic um, egotist, you have to play to that to some extent. So you, mm -hmm. you can solve this problem, uh, and you can be the one to lead us out of it, but you can't... Um, you know, denial's not a, it, it isn't a strategy, it doesn't work, and you need to help them uh, see that they're in denial sometimes, and the only way out of that is to help them be a bit safer, I find, so if you can make them detoxify, get, get the emotion out of the room, don't make it so public for them to have to talk about it, find a safe private group that they can talk about it in. Thank you very much. I think um, aligned to that, there's a, there's a follow-on question, um, we have from uh, Neil Golightly. Uh, Neil, would you like to join this conversation? Here we go. Great. Hey, um, Matt, great to see you again. It's been an awful long time and, and Bjorn, good to see you as, as always. Um, Matt, you touched on the role of the functional leader and the importance of the functional leader. And you made sort of a passing reference to the CCO that might need to make friends on the board, I think were the, were the words that you used. Uh, but I'm, I'm struck by the um, very tender position of a functional leader in this cycle. 
And at some point, if the, if the pariah company continues to go round and around this cycle, it seems to me there are three different outcomes for the, for the, for the leader, either resign on principle, um, become complicit in that cycle, or become a sacrificial lamb. Um, are there, is there another outcome for the functional leader? And is there a way to avoid getting to the point where one of those three becomes necessary? God, that's a re I think you're very on point with that analysis. I mean, if I may back up, a crisis is no time to start putting in place the relationships you need to fight a crisis. So you all know that, but that con that's as much in true inside the company as outside. So what I've found in the crisis I've been involved in, and you guys have been involved in as many or more as, than I have, is it's not, if, if you didn't have a board relationship before, you're not probably going to form one now unless it's through suddenly being asked to work on something together. So that's the first point. Be in advance of things, have a, have a wide network, and that will be your best bet whether you um, are hung out to dry or not. In terms of, the, is, there a, is there another option than complicity, resignation, or, 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 or uh, you know, crucifixion? Um, if I may give you those titles. Um, I, I would hope there is a survival option that isn't just collusion, but it might actually observe, observe in most companies, and most people in the organizations that survive, most of the senior people survive in these functions, at least for a while. Um, I think they sustain a lot of damage, actually. I think they're amongst the most damaged people by the... It's very hard afterwards, and there's a lot of guilt, and there's a lot of shame that people feel that they should have done more, they should have stopped these people, they should have been braver. And, and maybe it's about having places where people can download that real-time, talk about it real-time, and then muster their... Uh, you know, wherewithal to go at it together. So I, I've always found in crisis, if you can talk to your colleagues and say, hey, you know, we all need to gather around and support this CEO, but are we doing it in a concerted way? And are we, are we having the right impact? It's worth, it's a conversation worth having. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, this, this is the part of um, my, my day that I hate the most because I have to cut off the questions. We have great questions, uh, Matt Bjorn, I'll share them with you from um, Katerina Auer, uh, from uh, Amanda Coleman, Alan Lehman, Michael Jennings, Jan Delman, um, always great questions. I'm sorry, we haven't had a chance to get to you, um, but hopefully um, we'll be able to answer them offline. Um, so really, um, again, I promise to keep time for everyone um, and thank you for joining us for what we always call as a high protein segment. Um, and just to, to bring this together, um, what's, what's that saying? Um, the Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word crisis. Yeah? One brush stroke stands for danger and the other for opportunity. In a crisis, beware of danger, but recognize also the opportunity. And it's that, that, that change button and the things that you've been talking about, uh, Matt. Um, you know, thank you both for sharing with us how to be more aware of perhaps the all too common danger signs and how to, how to speak truth to power, to use that expression. Um, but so too, I think the important, the upside of it, that says looking forward um, from leadership to legacy, yeah? Um, and to a better place altogether, ideally, yeah, without too many sacrificial lambs along, along the way. So I think with that, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Great questions, a fantastic discussion. Matt, Bjorn, just wonderful to have you both with us um, in opposite countries and different, different, different settings, um, but just tremendous. Um, so thank you again. Um, and I hope all of you will join us again, same time, same place tomorrow. Um, where our next event will be um, with Matthew Gwyther, uh, the former editor of Management Today, um, in conversation with Sir Howard Davies, chair of NatWest and former uh, deputy governor of the Bank of England, talking about the F words tomorrow, fear, furlough and fairness. Thank you all and have a great afternoon, evening ahead or day ahead. All the best. Hope to see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye-bye.